in September of 1962, I entered seminary at Vanderbilt University. And I was told by the dean, while you have qualified for a, for a scholarship, no doubt you will need additional funds to live life from day to day, like for food and books and et cetera. And I'm sending you, since you need the job, I am sending you to one of the best student churches we have, First Christian Church, in La Center, Kentucky, 20 miles beyond Paducah. He said, the biggest hurdle, Houston, that you will discover in going to the First Christian Church in La Center is that it is 200 miles northwest of Nashville. Now remember, we're talking about 62. There are no interstates. He said, it will take you four hours to get there and four hours to come home. When I arrived at La Center, Kentucky on Friday afternoon for my very first experience with those folk, I was given a lot of instructions. You will live here, you will do this, you will do that, you et cetera, et cetera. Then I was invited to go home with the board chairman for dinner. And during the course of the meal, Mr. Berry, who was an elementary school teacher, principal, excuse me, principal, and also a hog farmer, you know, he's got to do something else, you know, just can't be playing around in school. He said in the course of the meal, Houston, you will be the seventh minister. You will be the seventh student minister that we have had. The last one that we had, Bill Paul Sell, he stayed seven years. First, he worked on his Master of Divinity degree, and then he worked on a PhD degree. He was with us for seven years. So I want you to understand this. For 32 years, we have had a student minister who has been in seminary at Vanderbilt. And then here's his big remark. There is nothing that you can tell us about religion that we don't already know. <laughs> well, there have been many a days in my life as a minister serving churches in Kentucky and in Texas and in Alabama and since 1977 in Ohio when that remark has been made on various occasions. There is nothing you can tell us about religion that we don't already know. Well, since I'm a Texan, that remark has had little effect on me. <laughs> Arrogant as we are in that Lone Star State, I have just smiled and said what I believe needs to be said. And that goes for today. So allow me to lay out before you in this sermon two global icons of existence. In this global world in which we live, there are two icons that I want you to get in your mind straight. The two icons, the jet airliner, a jet airliner, and a skyscraper. Two icons, two icons. On 9-11, they were turned into instruments of destruction. On that day, 17 days ago, the globe, our world, stopped, paused, and many a tear happened to be shed. On one hand, globalization, globalization, think about it. On one hand, globalization should bring us all together. It should bring us closer together, interweaving our lives, both nationally and internationally, weaving us in complex ways. On the other hand, on the other hand, a new tribalism, 
I don't know about you all, but I am taking a uh, pill that has to do with the weather and the change of the season, and I apologize, but it's about to itch off my face. <laughs> the pill is not working. On the other hand, on the other hand, globalization, on the other hand, a new tribalism has developed, a regression to older and more fractious loyalties is driving us even more angrily apart. And while Mr. Trump did not start this, while he did not start this, he has certainly milked it to his advantage. So we have, so we have globalization on one hand, and we have tribalism on the other hand. So what are we, with our religion in our backpacks, to do with what seems to be mounting anger, mounting frustration, confrontations abound before us and around us? And my goodness, are we going to see on TV this week a split screen with Mr. Kavanaugh on one side and Dr. Ford on the other, my goodness. There is no telling where all of this high combustibility in our world and in our nation will end. Unpack your religious backpack and as you do so, realize some things. Yes, Politicians have power. Oh, yes, they do. But religion has influence. Politics moves the pieces on the chessboard. But religion has the power to change lives in this world. The world cannot afford for religion to be eclipsed by politics are politicians. How did a small sect of Nazis gain control of Germany in the 1930s? It was in part because religion, and I mean Christianity, became mute, marginal, and mild. Now at first it seems that globalization might look like an enemy. And some of us might say, oh, the global age has turned our world into a society of strangers battling it out. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Globalization can be our friend. It can allow the teachings of our religious parents to be heard and utilized. Another way of saying it, one needs only a compass in that backpack. And the greatest face have been the compasses down through the centuries for all of humankind. Recognize, Judaism gave rise to two monotheisms, Christianity and Islam. And while each speaks in its own distinctive accent, while each is different, oh yes, different, Yet each has something unique to contribute, and every contribution that has been made counts and certainly counts today. It is at this point in my world picture that I want us to hear again this directive from Moses. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life so that your children may live. It is my belief that this directive might be fulfilled in our world if we link it with what Jesus said and Kevin read in Matthew 18. Hear it again. Hear just a portion of it again. Calling to him a child, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never ever enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can we handle such an invitation? 
Can we get on board with such a request? Is there any possibility at my age that I might discover some humility being an arrogant Texan as I am? Is there any possibility that I could give up any pretensions of self-importance, of independence, and self-reliance? Is that possible? Jesus is not calling us in this passage. He is not calling us to imitate the character traits, the character traits of children, but to accept a radical different understanding of status. The first rule for life together, for a blessed life, thank you Moses, life together in a new community formed by Jesus is to abandon the quest for status and to accept one's place as a child of God. I remember back to my childhood, which I have bored with you on various occasions that I was the oldest of three boys. Joe was four years younger than yours truly, and then Bill was six years younger than yours truly. At the age of 10, my father died, and his death created a monumental earthquake in our family. I guess it did. I've been talking about it forever. His death created this earthquake in our existence. Time and time again, after my father died, I can remember hearing my mother say, Houston, I'm going out. You look out for Joe and Bill. And I would say, do I have to? And she would always say, yes, you have to. As you have heard me say, my favorite preacher is the late Fred Craddock. He was not only my New Testament professor in college, in addition, he gave me sessions in homiletics, the skill, the art of preaching. Yeah, I know, he didn't do a good job, did he? <laughs> and his connection, with his connection, he's the one that helped me get a scholarship to go to Vanderbilt. With that said, there is one of his sermons that I love dearly, and it is entitled, does God have too many children? In this sermon, Dr. Craddock says, once in a prayer, now you have to, let's get this right. Once in a prayer, he heard God say, this is God speaking in Craddock's prayer, older ones take care of younger ones. The well ones take care of the sick ones. That's the way life works. Everyone is cared for. Furthermore, God said in Dr. Craddock's prayer, that is the law for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. So when you go home today, and when you begin unpacking your religious backpack, what will you find? I hope you will find some justice, and you will find some forgiveness. Justice is the impersonal, forgiveness is the personal. Justice rights wrong. Forgiveness rebuilds broken relationships. Forgiveness, forgiveness heals moral wounds the way the body heals physical wounds. And if Jesus was looking over your shoulder as you opened up that backpack, would his words, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself, and unless you become as little children, would those words tumble out of your backpack? Would those words become a brand new directive in life? Would those words now become your marching orders? Dr. Craddock said, my theological hero in life was Soren Kierkegaard, that Danish philosopher who lived in Denmark in the 1830s and the 1840s. Dr. Craddock said, 
I used to just eat up reading his journals. They meant so very much to me. And he said that in the journal he read from Soren Kierkegaard, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who are willing to give but do not have the means to give. And there are those people in the world who are able to give, but they refuse to give. And then Dr. Craddock said, obviously putting the journal down, Kierkegaard was wrong. There are not two kinds of people in the world. There are three kinds of people in the world. Those who are willing to give, but do not have the means to give. There are those who are able to give, but refuse to give. And then there's you, and you, and you, and you, and even me. Let us pray. In a global world, oh God, we must answer hatred with love. We must answer violence with peace. We must answer resentment with generosity of spirit. And we must answer conflict with reconciliation. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Invite you to stand with me as we sing together.